Hi friends, can't lose weight? Here's how to meal prep tasty foods to avoid processed foods, lose weight, and save a ton of money. Number one is to eat whole fruit with every meal. They are literally the tastiest, simplest foods to prep since you can just wash and eat. Only buy recognizable natural forms of fruits that a farmer grows. I usually fill a large gallon bag of pre-washed fruits to bring to work. Fruits need to be a part of every meal because they are low in calories, nutrient dense, and they can satisfy your sweet tooth. They also activate leptin, a satiety hormone, so that you don't overeat foods that are less healthy. Did I mention that they reduce cholesterol due to a soluble fiber? And by the way, that fiber will feed your gut microbiome and make short chain fatty acids like butyrate to help reduce inflammation and most importantly, help you poop every day. Your colonic cells need butyrate to squeeze your poop out because your colon is literally a large muscular tube that needs to contract or you will be constipated. I recently went on a field trip to visit Washington, D.C. as an adult chaperone for my child's school. Unfortunately, due to all the security in the federal buildings, I had to leave my backpack of fruits on the bus. I couldn't eat them until we got back to the hotel at 1030 every day. So I was struggling with constipation, which never happens to me because I eat fruit before every meal every day. That's how I control my weight. It keeps me full and saves me a ton of time. And you may be afraid to eat whole fruits like apples or bananas because they will raise your blood sugars. And I'll explain how you can easily reverse this in just a few days a little later. I only buy whole fruits like a whole apple and avoid apple flavored snacks or apple fruit bars like this. This is not whole fruit even though it's only made out of two ingredients apples and blueberries. This I considered a pretty processed food and highly concentrated in sugar and that's because they took the water out of fruit and then machines partially digested it to increase its surface area. A cup of blueberries has 80 calories and a cup of chopped fresh apples has 65 calories. Even if you ate two cups of fruit at max you would eat 160 calories and you would also be pretty full. There is 12 grams of carbohydrates in this one bar with nine of those grams being sugar. There's also only one gram of protein. So 70% of this bar is essentially sugar. Remember eight bars makes a cup and your stomach can hold five cups of food. And if you ate a cup of these fruit bars, you would be eating 72 grams of sugar, which is more than twice as much added sugar than the American Heart Association recommends eating an entire day. The ingredients, they didn't say any added sugar because they really didn't need to since they just concentrated sugar. It looks like this which just looks like a fruit bar, super sweet. It's pretty much concentrated sugar. And one cup of fresh apples, it also has 13 grams of sugar, as well as one cup of fresh blueberries has 14 grams of sugars. But fresh fruits are full of water, so you don't feel that concentrated sugar. And blueberries are even more unique because they are high in polyphenols and fiber. And together, they help to slow your digestion so that you don't get high insulin spikes and low sugar dips. Unfortunately, dried blueberry products, they don't have that polyphenol anti-inflammatory power. Now, if you ate two cups of fresh fruits, you would have a total of 27 grams of sugar that is trapped in water and whole fiber to be slowly released in your bloodstream over several hours. And there's nothing wrong with that as glucose is a preferred energy fuel. Now, if you're worried about fructose in fruit, well, just know that your gut microbiome can process about three grams of fructose. So as long as you avoid concentrated sugars like in this processed food, your gut microbiome can handle that fructose when you eat whole fruits. Now, do you see how buying processed foods can ruin weight control and metabolism, even if the ingredients are supposedly healthy? Now, this bag is $22 for 36 bars. So I would need to eat at least five cups of these bars to be full. And I would be eating 360 grams of sugar and 2,400 calories of food. Here is a chart of restaurant foods that are worth 2,400 calories or more in one meal. This is why meal prepping is so important. No one should be eating that many calories in one meal 
unless you are a super athlete like Michael Phelps. And contrary to popular belief, whole foods are cheaper to buy and healthier for you to eat. Sure, there are some specialty whole foods like dragon fruit that's a little bit more expensive, but I literally went to the 99 cent store in Southern California last year and spent less than $20, so less than what it costs to buy that bag of fruit bars, and that $20 fed my family of five one complete meal. These bars would not feed my family of five. Processing actually raises the price of food, even if all they did was cut up fruit. Think about how much a bag of apple slices cost, or worse, apple chips, which weighs less than a whole bag of apples. Now watch out for the apple-flavored oatmeals, which oftentimes has artificial ingredients. It would be healthier for you to just buy quick oats and put your own real apples in that oatmeal. The natural sugars found in whole fruits and vegetables are trapped in fiber. And remember, that slows the release of sugars to avoid those sugar highs, which contributes to insulin highs and then insulin resistance. All of this can cause you to gain weight. Now, number two is to buy whole leafy green vegetables every week. And these are vegetables that a farmer would grow and you should wash them immediately as soon as you get home. When you buy vegetables, vegetables, the goal is not to see how long you can make them last. A better goal would be to see how quickly you can eat them. Now, I generally avoid pre-cut salad packs because they are expensive. They also give me very little food. But if that's the only way you will eat vegetables and you can afford that price, then stick to what works for you. You may not like leafy greens and don't have a habit of eating them, but leafy greens are some of the best foods to eat to help you lose weight and control your blood sugar levels. Now, here is where understanding nutrient density is important. Nutrient-dense foods are low in calories, but packed with essential micronutrients to keep your body healthy. This is a nutrient density chart by Dr. Joel Furman. It's a great example of how to recognize micronutrient-rich foods that are full of vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. In this chart, foods in the green column are the most nutrient-dense, and they also have the least amount of calories. And that means they have the least amount of sugar and fat per gram of food, and they have a lot of fiber. But you need to eat a lot of leafy greens in weight to get that fiber. Most people eat very little leafy greens, so then that's not a great source of fiber. And when you eat these nutrient-dense, low-calories foods first before your meals, including breakfast, they will activate a satiety hormone called leptin to make you feel full, so you eat less highly caloric fatty foods, which are like croissants, eggs, bagels, and steak. The thing is, when you eat fat and sugar, your body gets mixed messages. Sugar and fat are both fuel sources, but they are regulated differently. Either one in excess results in storage of more fat, and unfortunately, when you eat these two fuels together, they can negatively affect your metabolism. For example, saturated fat turns off sugar metabolism, and this is because saturated fat inhibits the mitochondria from using sugar. This then downregulates insulin receptors. The end result is elevated blood sugars. This this has been shown in clinical trials in medical students fed high saturated fat diets. This study tested male medical students without diabetes and made half of them insulin resistant in two days. Here's what they did. 23 male medical students were split into four groups with four diets. Group one got a pretty good quality high protein diet with lean meat and egg white. Group two got a high fat diet with oil, mayonnaise, cream, and butter, which is essentially a ketogenic diet. Group three, they got nothing to eat and fasted for two days, which is also a popular weight loss strategy. However, did you hear about that new American Heart Association abstract linking fasting with an elevated rate of death from heart attacks? Now, although I personally am not a fan of prolonged fasting, this new abstract doesn't support or change my mind as it's not a well-designed study. And group four had a high carbohydrate diet with oats, brown rice, potatoes, fruit, bread, syrup, candy, and pastries, pretty much mostly processed carbs. Then all of these four groups were given a sugar challenge after two days, known as a glucose tolerance test. This is important to really tell if you have insulin resistance, because if you don't eat any carbohydrates, you never test your carbohydrate metabolism. And look at this graph. The people who fasted and the people who ate primarily fat had the highest glucose levels. And surprisingly, the people who ate the high carbohydrate diet had the best blood sugars. And sure, this was only a two-day study, but we have multiple studies that also support the improvement of 
insulin and glucose intolerance when you eat a high carbohydrate diet. This is really how type 1 diabetes was treated for decades after insulin was invented. This is how many doctors reduced the amount of insulin that their patients needed by having them eat a high carbohydrate diet. They reduced their insulin requirements. And this doesn't mean eating processed carbohydrate is a healthy diet. Point of the paper is to show you that if you truly want to reduce your insulin levels, carbohydrates, even processed, are not the problem. It's saturated fat. Saturated fat does more than inhibit blood sugar metabolism. When you eat saturated fat, it turns off your body's metabolism to use your own fat. This has been shown multiple times. And this is why before insulin was invented, people with type 1 diabetes were given a ketogenic diet, a high fat diet, essentially to save their lives. A ketogenic diet prevented those people with type 1 diabetes who didn't make any insulin to break down their own fat. And this is important because when you break down your fat, if you don't have insulin, you start a cascade of uncontrolled ketosis, basically uncontrolled ketone production, which can acidify your blood to deadly levels. That's a cause of diabetic ketoacidosis and acidifying your blood is very dangerous. And this is one of the reasons why so many type 1 diabetics died before insulin was discovered. But when you eat sugar, if you can make insulin, the insulin stops the process of breaking down your own body fat. That's why people with untreated type 1 diabetes are super skinny. So do you see how when you eat a high fat diet with a high carbohydrate diet, the end result is weight gain and high blood sugars? You have to either give up carbohydrate or give up fat. Both of these will help you lose weight. If you give up fat, that means you need to give up processed carbohydrate foods with added fats, cooking oils, and animal products like meats and chicken, because these are all the foods with lots of fat. This is very hard to do, and that's why so many people won't give that up. But the problem is, when you overeat protein, that too can increase your insulin, and it can be converted to carbohydrates to elevate your blood sugar. Actually, eating red meat is associated with a higher risk of diabetes. But of course, your body may just find better benefit taking out processed foods. And I think no matter which diet camp you're in, everybody agrees processed carbohydrates are just not healthy foods. However, short-term health and long-term longevity is more than blood sugar and insulin levels, but you can reverse your insulin resistance and glucose intolerance within three days by cutting out fat in your diet. If you avoid fat, you can make yourself more insulin sensitive. This can all help you lower your insulin levels, which can then allow your body to burn your own fat tissue to reverse the root cause of your glucose intolerance that is giving you diabetes or prediabetes and help you lose weight. If you don't continue to eat like that, if you gain the weight back and if you gain the fat back, then of course you're going to get the glucose intolerance back. But if you don't eat the carbs, you won't see blood sugar spikes. But even if you don't eat any sugar, you may still see elevated early morning fasting blood sugars that are higher than what you expect. This is really the harm of chasing lab values. A normal lab value may not mean that you're getting healthier, nor does it mean that you have corrected the underlying cause of the problem. However, let's make things more complex. Any diet that can help you lose some weight, about 20 pounds, will help you correct much of the glucose intolerance, and that may just be enough to reverse your glucose intolerance and diabetes. But remember, the metabolism of glucose is only one part of health, and if you pick your wrong diet to get that metabolism to look good, are you really sacrificing your immunity and your longevity? Maybe you're unknowingly triggering other metabolic pathways that are detrimental to that longevity. Because I see the end results of all diets, I have a unique viewpoint. Since I'm a clinical super specialist and deal with critical life-threatening conditions caused by people's lifestyle, you could basically abuse your body for a number of decades, and no matter what diet you pick, you'll just chug along until it absolutely just dies. And that's why nutrition is so hard and the internet is full of personal opinions. Don't take my opinion. However, you should take a look at national guidelines on your own formulated by experts in the field. And if you don't trust these guidelines, then what are you going to do when you get your heart attack or a stroke or broken bones or life-threatening conditions like sepsis? Because it's the same medical system that makes these guidelines that has literally saved millions of lives. I work in this medical system. So the day Dangers of following a single person who has very unusual viewpoints can be your health. And just know that none of these diets are new unless you are investing in new foods like eating the processed foods that the food industry is creating. And that's why you really should reconsider eating processed foods. Did you know that fiber is also a carbohydrate except that your body can't break it down to use as energy? So when you eat whole foods with natural carbohydrates and natural fiber, you actually you're building a fiber wall to trap in 
in calories. Food that contains water and fiber activate leptin, which doesn't happen if you eat fiberless foods like pastries and breads. And this is why people gain weight eating processed foods made out of flour, which is worse when you add fat to that flour, like cake. The trick to eating whole leafy greens is really to meal prep. So this means you need to pre-wash and maybe even pre-cut them. Think about your kids. When you wash and cut vegetables and leave them on the table, there's a higher chance that they're going to walk by and grab some. But if you make them do the prep work, good luck. They probably won't eat any. And this is the same for me. If I pre-wash and pre-cut my leafy greens, whenever I'm in a hurry, I can just pour it in a bowl and eat it. If I have to wash it and cut it, I too struggle to do it because I'm tired. I'm really busy. And this is a great way to make your own salads, a great way to meal prep your own vegetables. I like to mix hearty leafy greens like kale and cabbages with softer ones like romaine lettuce and herbs. And if you do this, make sure you keep all your leaves separate and store them separately with a paper towel to collect the condensation. This way they stay fresh longer. The condensation will make your leaves rot a lot faster. Try to consume the softer leaves first. It really won't last a week. The hearty vegetables, the cruciferous vegetables may last a whole week, but remember your point is to eat as many vegetables as quickly as possible. Number three is to pre-cook whole grains. I usually will pre-cook my grains for a whole week and refrigerate half and freeze the other half to keep it fresher. I don't really find a problem with the texture, but it does taste slightly different. However, this saves me so much time because many whole grains take a bit longer to cook, except for maybe quinoa, which is a quick 15 minutes. Frankly, I really don't want to even spend that 15 minutes cooking one single food. And this is why I have an Instapot, which is a pressure cooker. If I'm going to use that Instapot, I'm going to cook several grains at one time. This way I can get a variety of nutrients with one scoop. I literally rinse, add water, and then just cook. Sometimes I'll put spices, other times I won't, and I'll just eat it sort of like rice to help me with other dishes. My personal goal is to eat 50 different types of whole foods every week with 50 grams of fiber a day. And there is just no way to do this unless I prep my meals because I have to work, I have duties at home, and now I'm YouTubing. And by the way, cooking pre-cooked grains are actually metabolically healthier. Grains contain a lot of starch, which is really essentially glucose. There are two types of molecules, amylose and amylopectin. Amylose, that's the molecule that raises your blood sugar, but amylopectin does not. And when you cool down the grains, refrigerate or freeze them, the cold temperature starts a chemical reaction to make amylose bind to amylopectin. And this new molecule is called resistant starch, which your body can't absorb. So when you eat those grains, there's actually 30% less calories per bite. Now, isn't that pretty neat? Grains are pretty controversial because so many processed foods are made from grains, especially wheat. Now, if there's one food that carnivore, keto, and whole food plant-based people and I agree with, and that is avoiding flour. Flour is not a whole food. Wheat flour is a highly processed food. And of course, there are healthier versions, but ultimately, they're both highly processed caloric foods. One cup of wheat flour is 408 calories. However, one cup of cooked farro wheat kernels is 169 calories. And that one cup of cooked farro has twice as much fiber than a cup of white flour, which can make a 10-inch pizza crust. So when you eat that pizza crust, that dough starts digesting in your mouth because you have enzymes called amylase that will digest that amylose. But that farro, that's harder for the enzymes to reach because it's surrounded by a fibrous shell. Flour not only takes the work of digestion away from the body, it also easily becomes pure glucose. So if you're worried about sugar spikes, eating ground up powdered flour that is glued together with water to form a dough, and then you add fat sometimes, well, that's not a good idea unless you need that quick energy like Civil War soldiers. Now, this is a hardtack, which is a Civil War biscuit soldiers would carry to go to war. This is just made out of flour and water, and it's as hard as a tack. This is essentially dehydrated bread or a cracker, and literally a type of poor man's pastry to allow soldiers to carry food on the field in battle. If you bit into this hardtack, you would literally break your teeth. So the soldiers ate this by soaking it in water to make it soft and edible. Sound familiar? Kind of like your breakfast cereal, right?
right? If you look at pictures of Civil War soldiers, they are never overweight, even though they ate highly processed, refined, floury foods like this hardtack. And there's two main reasons they weren't overweight. Number one, they didn't get much food. And number two, they walked 15 miles a day. Today, we are drowning in our modern versions of hardtacks with breads, cereals, pastries, cakes, crackers, chips, and they are much tastier because we've added sugars and fats. And in addition, the average American walks maybe a mile a day, if even that. Unlike the Civil War soldiers who would get a limited weekly supply of hardtacks, today we have an endless supply of our modern versions of hardtacks. So it makes it really hard for anyone to lose weight. And this is why if you focus on eating nutrient-dense whole foods and you do the food preps, you will be much more successful at getting healthier. Because when you get healthier, the weight will naturally come off, even if you don't exercise. But of course, exercise is good for many reasons, including blood sugar and weight control. So I really encourage people to exercise as much as possible. Throughout human history, people have heavily focused on protein, fat, and carbohydrate for fuel because food was so scarce. Literally in ancient times, you had to spend hours hunting or fishing for animal meat or gathering fruits and vegetables. As humans began to travel, they brought foods with them and focused on three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates, not realizing that there are actually six essential categories of nutrients and missing any one single vitamin or mineral from this list can get you very sick. Now, I would argue that there are more than six nutrients for longevity and that this list is only adequate for survival. So if you want to go for longevity, then you need a list of eight nutrients with the latter two focusing on powering your gut microbiome with fiber and phytonutrients. Now, this list are just the known essential vitamins and minerals, and they are all metabolized in your body differently. Luckily for people, both animal products and fruits and vegetables, they overlap in many of these micronutrients. But there are some exceptions, and if you don't know the exceptions, you can get in a lot of trouble. One exception is vitamin C, which is only adequately found in plants like fruits and vegetables. But 40% of Americans, they still aren't eating an adequate daily amount of vitamin C. Make sure you have vitamin C rich foods prepped, ready to eat daily. Now, many people only think about taking vitamin C when they are sick. They know it helps the body remove toxins because it is a strong antioxidant. Well, vitamin C is vital for good skin, good blood pressure, good mental health, good bowel movements, and necessary for good metabolism. Now, did you know that your brain is the organ that uses the most vitamin C? Your brain undergoes massive amounts of oxidative stress, even if you don't move, because it is made out of fat and electricity. That energy is shooting through left and right all over, and all this fat is getting oxidized all the time. It's like burning butter. That brown color is bad. Have you ever cut an apple and put some lime or lemon on on it. Other people use that to prevent browning. That's the power of vitamin C to prevent oxidation. And this is because vitamin C inhibits an enzyme in the apple called polyphenol oxidase. When polyphenol oxidase is activated by oxygen, it can reduce beneficial polyphenols in other foods such as blueberries. So fruits that tend to brown like bananas and apples, it's not good to eat them with polyphenol rich foods like blueberries. Oxidizing your brain will literally shut it off. That's why we all need the antioxidant vitamin C to think better. And when you think better, you make better decisions, you make better food choices, as well as financial choices, and you will have better immunity. But if your brain doesn't get enough vitamin C, there will be nothing left for your immunity. Now, the RDA has a ridiculously low value of 75 milligrams of vitamin C for women, which is the amount necessary to prevent a deadly disease called scurvy. But if your goal is to prevent scurvy, well, you're on the wrong boat of health. It's like aiming to pass your class with the minimal amount of effort. That's not the ideal way to make education useful. The 16th to 18th century sailors, they didn't know about micronutrients, so they focused their diets on meat, dairy, and bread, these three macronutrients, and literally 2 million sailors died from scurvy. In fact, governments, they just expected to lose 50% of their sailors at sea. Imagine if we still had that expectation in our military today. Scurvy is a pretty brutal way to die. First, you get really tired and lethargic. It was so intense that it was believed to cause laziness. On top of that, your joints ache and then you bruise so easily with the slightest touch. When it really gets bad, your breath gets fetid, your teeth get loose, and you develop spontaneous open wounds. In the very end, scurvy 
kills by causing a heart attack or a stroke because you need vitamin C to make collagen. And that's the glue that holds your entire body together, including your blood vessels. So if you are investing in collagen supplements and you haven't maximized the collagen your own body can make with adequate vitamin C, well, then you may be wasting your money. In the 17th century, a group of English sailors barely clinging to life were swept off their intended transatlantic sail path by a storm and ultimately found refuge on Juan Fernandez Island. Luckily for them, the island, abundant in fruits and vegetables, helped restore the health of the 335 remaining survivors out of the original 1,200 men who embarked on the journey on three naval ships. So 72% of English sailors died of scurvy before they even reached the island. I'm telling you this story because this is a powerful reminder that eating the right foods is healing medicine. And it took these men at least 21 days to recover, and eventually they all sailed back to England to tell them of their discovery. In case you didn't know, vitamin C is not heat stable, so cooked fruits and vegetables have much less vitamin C. Guess which fruit has the highest vitamin C? If you think it's the orange, and that's because the first documented randomized controlled trial was done with oranges to nurse sailors back to health. But that red bell pepper in your salad has more vitamin C than three oranges. Just because a food tastes sour doesn't mean it has a lot of vitamin C. Vinegar tastes sour, it doesn't have any vitamin C. The English tried to give vinegar to prevent scurvy, but that never worked. The British sailors were called limeys because they brought lemons and limes as their vitamin C source, which actually don't have high levels of vitamin C. But something is better than nothing. Now, incredibly, the U.S. Navy refused to learn from this world history and still struggled with scurvy in the 19th century. Today, the U.S. Navy encourages 2.6 cups of vegetables and 2 cups of fruits daily, which is really not enough. My friend worked in a Navy hospital cafeteria about 11 years ago, and there was literally a sign that said, limit two fruits a day. This is a horrible rule, and I hope that they change that. Everyone should be eating at least four servings of fruits a day and at least five servings of vegetables with four of those servings being leafy green vegetables. Number four is to prep beans once a week. Beans probably need the most prepping because you should soak your dried beans for at least four hours to reduce phytic acid. It's actually believed to be a powerful DNA protective and anti-cancer molecule, and it also can help prevent kidney stones by inhibiting calcium crystal buildup. So then why should we get rid of it? Well, you don't have the enzyme to break it down, and as it passes through your gut, it binds to iron, zinc, and calcium to prevent their absorption. This can be good if you have iron overload, like those with hemochromatosis, but people who eat a lot of beans are basically vegetarians and vegans, and they actually need to be more conscious about iron-rich foods. But by cooking it until they're soft enough to be squished by your tongue on the roof of your mouth, then you really can essentially remove all the phytic acid. And this is why Instapots are so great. Slow cookers won't work. It's not hot enough so that they won't remove the phytic acid. Beans are rich in potassium as well as fiber. And 99% of Americans, they don't get an adequate amount of potassium, nor do they get an adequate amount of fiber on a daily basis. If you have kidney issues, make sure that you check with your nephrologist because potassium-rich foods may not be right for you unless your nephrologist gives you binders. Many people think bananas are high in potassium, but a cup of cooked beans like lima beans has twice as much potassium as a medium-sized banana. I usually stock up on unflavored, unsalted canned beans for those super busy days. And so that was number five. Now, beans like chickpeas and black beans, they're not only a great source of fiber and potassium, but they are also a great source of protein. And together, all these properties help to regulate blood sugar levels suppress your appetite, and overall reduces your weight. Beans even work the day after you eat them. Now I know this is easier said than done because beans can make people feel bloated. And that is because the fiber, it draws in a lot of water and that expands your colon. And if you're not used to that expansion, then you'll be a little uncomfortable. So like an athlete, you have to train your gut to work up to tolerate that can of beans. Now remember, the journey is for your lifetime, so there's no need to rush it. Just start with one bean a day with your meals. Then each day, add another bean, and then add another one with the next meal. Keep doing this every day. It may take you several weeks to work up to eating just one cup of beans in a day. Number six is a bean I always have handy to eat as a snack, or I eat it as a part of a healthy meal, and that is hummus. Hummus is so simple to make, or you can buy it pre-made, but just be aware they add quite a bit of salt in some hummus brands. It's really simple to make 
So I take a can of garbanzo beans and I rinse that. And then I add a clove of garlic, which sometimes I may microwave with a little oil to take the heat out. I will add tahini or ground up roasted sesame paste and a lot of onion powder and garlic powder. My kids like spicy, so sometimes I'll throw in a chili pepper. So with that chili pepper cilantro, I will add some salt, only in miso to taste. And this whole thing goes in a blender with a little bit of olive oil and maybe some water, and then I squeeze a little bit of lemon juice. Now, after you blend it up, this makes a great dip, a great spread, a great dressing, and you can even eat it right from the spoon. Number seven is another bean that I have in my freezer. That's edamame beans. They are so fun to eat. They have a slightly crispy texture. Usually they're ready pre-cooked and you just need to heat them. I eat them as a part of all my meals or it's just a great snack. One cup of edamame beans has eight grams of fiber and 18.4 grams of protein. They also have 675 grams of potassium. Number eight is another type of soybean that is my favorite go-to easy protein and calcium source, tofu. If you want something with a chewier texture, then freeze a box of firm tofu overnight and defrost them before you cook them. Squeeze all that water out and you'll get a chewier and firmer texture that is good cubed and seared like meat. You're gonna need a little bit of oil and try to work on a non-stick pan. A cup of tofu has 19.88 grams of protein and 860 grams of calcium. Now there's a lot of controversy about soy foods, just like there's a lot of controversy about estrogen replacement hormones. Soy phytoestrogens, they're not like the estrogen women get in hormone replacements. The natural plant, it has survived the test of time thousands of years through millions of people, but hormone replacement, that was only introduced in 1942. And did you know that estrogen, Premarin, was from the urine of pregnant horses? Premenopausal women, they just have more estrogen. But if you're worried about estrogen, then make sure you aren't constipated. And on top of that, you should be avoiding poultry, beef, or pork, or products made from mammals like dairy, since that is where you get the most potent estrogens that can mimic your own body's estrogen. Mammalian estrogen hormones are thousands of times more estrogenic than endocrine disrupting chemicals found in your water. And that's why Premarin from horses is an effective treatment for postmenopausal symptoms, which really they're uncomfortable, but they don't kill anybody. Unlike Premarin, literally you can increase your risk of endometrial cancers, cardiovascular diseases, breast cancer, and probable dementia. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. It's literally on the black box label. But even if you don't eat animals, you're probably exposed to the estrogen pollution in farm animals due to the tons of poop that they make, which can get into your drinking water and food supply. Plant phytoestrogens, they're different. Certain plants like soybean, they have unique phytoestrogens. And yes, many plant chemicals interact with your body and modulate your hormones. The popular diabetes drug metformin is biguanide. That's originally purified from the French lilac, which was prescribed in medieval times as a prescription to relieve intense urination, which is a symptom of uncontrolled blood sugars or diabetes. Metformin also affects your hormone like GLP-1 to reduce your appetite and blood sugars. The soybean is concentrated in unique phytoestrogens called isoflavone, specifically genistein and diazin, which both have a much weaker effect than your own estrogen and any other animal estrogens that you eat. The unique thing about phytoestrogens is that they can also exert anti-estrogenic effects. And different soy products, they have different amounts of isoflavones as in this table. Your body also makes different different estrogens. Premenopausal women have higher levels of estradiol, and when they eat plant phytoestrogens, those plant chemicals will act more like anti-estrogens, protecting them from the negative effects of too much estradiol, which can promote cancer growth. However, postmenopausal women stop making estradiol, hence they get postmenopausal symptoms. But that's not true for every postmenopausal women, especially Asian women. Asians suffer much less postmenopausal symptoms. This is because they are benefiting from the weak estrogenic effects of soy isoflavones. If you're a man, you may have heard rumors it can cause gynecomastia, enlargement of breast tissue. All men and women need estrogen, but everything good also has a limit. Sure, if you make it to a soy and drink three quarters of a gallon daily, you may get gynecomastia. Who does that? 
However, here's a list of the more common causes of gynecomastia that have nothing to do with food. The reason why phytoestrogens can have opposing effects is because there are two types of estrogen receptors, alpha and beta receptors, and these receptors affect tissue differently. They actually have opposing effects. Beta receptors inhibit breast growth, and phytoestrogens like genistein in the soybean, they target beta receptors to stop breast cancer growth. It is a very weak alpha receptor trigger, which promotes growth. And you really have to mega dose soybeans and eat way over two dozen cups a day to even come close to the potency of Premarin. Now the liver has alpha receptors and when that's triggered, it causes a release of clotting factors. That's why Premarin can cause blood clots. Alpha receptors also promote breast tissue to grow. Animal estrogens are just like your body's own natural estradiol and estrone to promote breast and uterine tissues to grow. This is also why Premarin increases the risk of breast cancer and uterine cancer. If you have an estrogen receptor positive cancer, you may be offered tamoxifen. That drug blocks the receptor to compete with estrogen to prevent the cancer from growing. Now, my goal is to prevent cancer before I get cancer. And women who eat soy can reduce the risk of endometrial cancer by 30%. And as an added bonus, it can dramatically reduce postmenopausal symptoms without the nasty side effects of medication like Premarin. As a medical doctor, I always think less is more. So I try to find foods that can preserve my health span. And I drink soy milk for several other reasons. Another reason is to preserve my bone density. This study showed an increase in bone mineral density, especially in the lumbar spine. Bone density is really meaningless unless you can reduce fractures. And that's why osteoporosis drugs, they don't work as intended and they can cause fractures. Soy, on the other hand, has been shown to help reduce fractures. I encourage my kids to eat soy too because eating soy as children, teenagers, and as adults, they're all associated with decreased risk of breast cancer. And by the way, men can get breast cancer too. Now, if you're against soy because it's GMO or have been sprayed with glyphosate, then buy organic soy and minimally processed soy products like soy milk and tofu. They've been eaten by Asians for thousands of years without any weight or obesity problems. Plus, countries who eat soy live 10 years longer than the average person in America. So please don't confuse traditional Asian soy products like tofu, soy milk, and edanami beans with modern day processed soy protein isolates. However, even plant protein isolates are still considered healthier than eating animal protein. In fact, eating plant proteins can help to lower blood pressure, reduce LDL cholesterol, and improve insulin sensitivity even when it's highly processed like an impossible burger. To be clear, I don't typically eat isolated plant products, whether it's sugar, fiber, or soy protein isolates. However, if you ask me to choose between a beef hamburger versus an impossible hamburger, well, I will always choose the impossible hamburger because of the benefits outlined above. And in addition, beef, that's associated with a higher risk of food poisoning like E. coli, colon cancer, heart disease, and strokes. Number nine is to stock up on frozen blueberries. Berries are the only fruit that I will blend because they have been shown not to spike blood sugars. And I give my family a berry smoothie as dessert that is made out of three simple ingredients every day. Dinosaur kale, soy milk, and a cup of frozen blueberries. Now, my family, they want something sweet to end their meal, and they will go look for something sweet that is less healthy to eat. So I make sure I finish their meal off with this anti-inflammatory smoothie. It's also a great way for them to eat kale and blueberries. I can understand why they don't like raw kale, but they also won't eat fresh blueberries whole. But that's okay because the only fruit that has been shown not to spike and elevate sugar and insulin when you blend it are berries like blueberries. And this is probably because it's high in fiber, polyphenols, and both of them actually help to slow the digestion of the sugar inside the berries. As a bonus, this smoothie can enhance memory, athletic performance, and recovery. And if you sip it slowly, it can fill you up and help you lose weight. Now, number 10 is handy to have all year round, and that is walnuts. Now, I don't know about you, but when I cook, I am always hungry. So I look for snacks as I wait for things to finish cooking. If you have walnuts handy, it is a great time to eat them. Walnuts are a great snack for several reasons. First, they actually can help you fill you up and help you lose weight. It helps you eat less other food. It's also a great source of alpha linolenic acid, which gets converted into essential omega-3 fatty acids necessary to live, unlike cholesterol, which 
by the way, your body can make on its own. So technically, you don't need to eat any cholesterol. In fact, if you can't eat any food, and there are many people who can't, your doctor will give you an infusion called Total Parental Nutrition, TPN. That was invented in 1968. There is zero cholesterol in those formulations. So for people who believe eating cholesterol is critical to live, I have to respectfully disagree with that statement because tens of thousands of children and adults who cannot eat any food and are 100% dependent on intravenous nutrition for the rest of their lives can live on TPN for years and decades without any cholesterol. I mean, we literally can't infuse cholesterol since they're solid and it's going to plug up the catheter as well as your arteries. The good news is different organs that need cholesterol can make their own cholesterol. So even though you don't eat it, doesn't mean you won't make it. Your brain makes it by itself, your adrenal glands. I mean, if you look at a baby, they have super low blood cholesterol, but they have rapidly developing healthy brains. Now, some people think that having super low cholesterol is a bad marker, and really that depends on the person. You see, your body can make all the cholesterol you need if you have a healthy liver. So people with liver failure will have very low cholesterol, and that's a marker of the seriousness of their liver. Now, if your body needs a lot of cholesterol like sepsis, you may also have low cholesterol because you are using it up so quickly to make new cells, to make new immune cells. Cholesterol serves many roles in your body from cell membrane integrity to cell signaling to immunity. It makes steroid and sex hormones. It also is a part of vitamin D production, bile acid production, and oxalsterols. Because of its multiple roles, the body ensures that it can make its own. And one thing for sure, cholesterol travels with proteins called lipoproteins, and you may have high LDL cholesterol and wondering if it matters. And that's a great topic for the next video. See you there.